there! Welcome to Skating Key Productions. I'm Kyra Grace Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video, we're going to be asking the question of what if Ronald Reagan won in 1968? Now, for those who know a little bit about the history of Ronald Reagan, yeah, they'll know that he became the president in 1980. However, not many people know that his win in 1980 was actually the third time he had tried to become president. And the first time was in 1968, the second time was in 1976, and obviously the third time was in 1980. So, you know, as the old saying goes, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And that's certainly what Ronald Reagan did. So in 1968, Ronald Reagan was up against Richard Nixon, who had been the vice president in uh, 1960 and who had uh, run and uh, lost against uh, JFK, which we've done a video on, so definitely give that a watch because, you know, that's very good. And there's a lot of overlap between this video and that. So some, for some of the finer details, you'll need to uh, watch that. But in the Republican convention of 1968, Ronald Reagan actually got a majority of votes. Hmm? That sounds a bit strange. How can you get a majority of votes and still lose? Well, the reason for that is that the convention system uh, for uh, picking uh, who's going to be the candidate uh, for each party in uh, election time, uh, it wasn't as entrenched as it is now. And so, you yeah, know, the process was, it was a little bit murky and stuff, right? So as a result, even though he got a majority of votes, in actual fact, Richard Nixon ended up winning. Now, the reason for this was basically because outside of the state of California, where Ronald Reagan had recently become governor, he didn't do very well amongst the, you know, amongst the other states. Yeah, like Richard Nixon beat him like like but you know by like sixty percent plus in a lot of the states. And the only reason why he ended up even winning in California was because his name was the only name that appeared on the ballot. So. You know, the vast majority of the votes that he had was as a result of winning the state of California, but he ended up dropping out the race because you know, he didn't get the, the right number of uh, delegates. So, yeah, but either way, it was a way of him kind of uh, testing the water, so to speak, and to see just how popular like, he was like, within his party and like, within the country as a whole. Because up until this point, Ronald Reagan hadn't really been known on the public stage for being a politician. As a matter of fact, you know, like, so a little quick brief uh, rundown of his, of his history. So he was born in a small town uh, in Illinois uh, to a, a relatively poor family. And, uh, and his father was, um, you know, he was a drunken. So he, he had a relatively difficult childhood. But when he was a child, he always envisioned, you know, like uh, helping people and stuff, right? And uh, this is why he took a job as being a lifeguard. And then when he got older, he then decided to, you know, go into the world of acting. And this is when he ended up becoming a Hollywood star. I'm not a major, major star, but like, you know, he, you know, he def de definitely uh, rubbed shoulders with like all the, the current actors at that time. And he was a very close friend of uh, John Wayne, who was obviously really big at the time as well. And him and John Wayne eventually end up like sharing a lot of the same values. This wasn't the case when he first went out there. Because when he first went out there, he was a New Deal Democrat. So he was a very liberal, like kind of like very like progressive uh, Democrat. Uh, Thomas Sowell, the economist, uh, famously joked once that Ronald Reagan was so far to the left that the CIA had files on him uh, during the McCarthy era. And actually what's interesting is that Ronald Reagan to this day is the first president and so far the only president who is not only a member of a trade union, but was actually the leader of a trade union. And this is in the Screen Actors Guild. So while his acting career didn't really take off, like, you know, he was in a few minor films and he was in a few, like, TV shows and stuff, he used that time to basically kind of build his kind of political credentials and stuff within that trade union. And then he then ended up taking a job in General Electric um, and, you know, he would go about as a spokesman for them, so to go to all the different plants around the country and speaking to people there, like, you know, giving talks and stuff, he'd talk to them about government and talk to them about taxes and regulations and everything, right? And, um, and yeah, so over time, his views began to change. He went from being an uh, avid supporter of people like FDR and like Harry Truman and stuff and bit by bit he ended up becoming a, a conservative a Republican. And this was compounded when he ended up meeting his uh, second wife, uh, Nancy Reagan. And also something to note is that Ronald Reagan was the first president who had been a divorcee. So, you know, up until that point, there had been a bit of a stigma about it, but he was the first one who uh, kind of broke that stigma as such. But Ronald Reagan really burst onto the political scene in 1964. And this is when he gave his famous speech, which, you know, Reaganites uh, even today will uh, refer to as being the speech. And people more commonly like refer to it as a time for choosing. This is a speech in which he uh, campaigned for Barry Goldwater for the presidency in 1964. And in this speech that he basically outlined all of his beliefs and uh, why people ought to uh, vote for the Republican Party, you know. So he spoke about like the Cold War and how America was in retreat and how 
you know, they were basically fighting a kind of, not just a, a military war, not just economic war, but also a spiritual war against like uh, the Soviet Union, which he would later refer to as being the evil empire. And, you know, he also spoke in that about the growing size of the federal government and about like the, the welfare state. He basically said the reason why he left the Democratic Party was I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. And this kind of represents the kind of the leftward shift uh, that the Democratic Party took in the 1950s and 60s away from kind of more traditional kind of uh, small government values. And this was mainly the reason why he ended up becoming a Republican in the first place, because he could see people like uh, like JFK and like uh, LBJ uh, pushing for uh, programs uh, like what ended up becoming the Great Society. You know, and like he really railed against like kind of the welfare state and yeah, especially that kind of like, as he called them, welfare bums. And, you know, he famously said that, uh, you know, he was in favour of sending the welfare bums back to work. So, yeah, he's just, um, yeah, he's, he, he didn't mince his words, basically, when he was saying things. And it was soon after this that he ended up becoming the governor for California. And actually, he ended up, you know, building quite a reputation for himself as being someone who was vehemently against the peace movement, being vehemently against that hippie movement in general, and against the kind of, like, left libertarian uh, values of the kind of, like, 60s era. Now, people who know about Ronald Reagan as the president, you know, you know, he's always a kind of smiling, like, warm-hearted kind of guy, You're always making jokes and stuff, and actually I've got a Reagan joke, well, Reagan-style joke for you in a little bit, but just wait. But this was a very different Reagan from the one who became governor in 1966, because his rhetoric and, like, how he, like, ran his state was in a very kind of harsh way. You know, like, famously, there was the Berkeley protest, uh, which was at the University of Berkeley, in which there was a bunch of peace protesters there, and these protesters, you know, started to riot, started to burn down bits of the campus, and so as a result, you know, he sent in the State National Guard. He sent in uh, 2,200 of them. And many people in the kind of hippie movement expected public opinion to, you know, see it as like an overreaction and to take their side. But what a lot of people who uh, look at the 60s don't really recognise is that the peace movement, the hippie movement, you know, all the kind of musicians and the general culture that we think of was limited to a very tiny subset of the youth population and that, you know, the vast majority of people were, you know, as, as Richard Nixon would famously say, the great silent majority. And these people were traditional, these people were patriotic, they were pro the war and, you know, they were opposed to the kind of like liberal values uh, that were espoused in this time. So as a result, these protesters really underestimated uh, Reagan's support and, you know, they soon learned that uh, public opinion was definitely not on their side, but was on the side of Ronald Reagan. So in this timeline, we're going to assume that Ronald Reagan somehow ends up winning the Republican uh, convention in 1968 and then goes on to win the presidency just as Richard Nixon did in that year. So within our timeline, there was obviously no Watergate because that was you know, what uh, Richard Nixon did and you know, he ended up having to step down in 1974 as a result of it. Now, Reagan had his own uh, scandal, which was the Iran-Contra scandal, but that was a very like specific thing to that very like era and so i don't see reagan kind of getting caught up in the same kind of scandal so for the sake of this timeline we're going to assume that ronald reagan is the president from 1968 to 1976. so how would america and the world have been different if he was president that's what we're going to find out here now, first of all, we're going to start this video by talking about the Vietnam War. So, the Vietnam War in 1968, you know, you had the famous Tet Offensive, and in the eyes of many uh, people, this is when the Vietnam War was lost for America. But this isn't necessarily true. So, in terms of public opinion, you know, because the American public had been told for many, many years that they were on the verge of winning that war, people were very surprised when the, the North Vietnamese, you know, and like the Viet Cong end up pulling off this, this crazy offensive. But in reality, it was a complete like defeat for the, the NVA and the VC because in reality, they just didn't have any more capability. You know, they, they'd taken a huge, huge risk and had thrown everything into defeating the Americans and kicking out the South Vietnamese government and they'd still lost. So they didn't have any more uh, like resources to kind of fight this kind of war at this scale. And actually later reports from the Vietnamese government has now like been released and they've actually confirmed that had the war continued as it had uh, after that point, like uh, kind of in the same the same level of American involvement, the same level of uh, ferocity against them, that eventually they would have had to sue for peace because they just simply didn't have the capacity to keep this war going. However, in the eyes of the American public, this war was like an uh, unwinnable war. And so this kind of started Vietnamization, which was just a code word basically for the Americans pulling out. 
the number of troops end up uh, steadily declining and America poured loads and loads of money and resources and weapons and stuff into the South Vietnamese government and then they end up eventually losing. Because the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong in the next seven years were able to regroup, they were able to rebuild and as a result they were then able to, you know, when the Americans left in 73, two years after that they end up seizing Saigon and North and South Vietnam was united under a communist government. So the Vietnam War ended up being lost but if Reagan had been president would this necessarily have happened? Well Reagan said in an interview many years later that he wasn't in favour of the war at the beginning but once America was in like the war should be won and so he would have put everything into America winning that war you know he might have kept the war going and even escalated and you know increased the troop numbers and stuff in spite of what many people in the public uh, were, were kind of protesting about and I think that you know he would have really really pushed hard on it so for instance in 1970 when the Nixon administration invaded Cambodia but then ended up retreating as a result of public opinion kind of being against it I think that Ronald Reagan still would have pushed ahead with this and as we discussed in that previous video about uh, JFK and Nixon, uh, you know, the, the Viet Cong end up going down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was in Laos and Cambodia. And so I think that if they'd been able to take Cambodia, then that would have uh, seriously uh, dented uh, the, the, the number of supplies and uh, men who could get through uh, that Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so as a result, the war in the South would have been a lot like, less intense and it would have been a lot easier to have held down uh, the, that territory. However, something to note is that Ronald Reagan's rhetoric was much, much more intense than there had been for any other president up until that point. So I think that the Cold War, which in our own timeline was, you know, they were pushing towards detente, which is relaxation of tensions. I think that Reagan would have gone the exact opposite uh, direction. You know, like in his famous speech, uh, Time for Choosing, he talks about how we cannot abide our security, our freedom from the threat of the bomb by committing an immorality so great as saying to a billion people now trapped behind the Iron Curtain, give up your dreams of freedom. Because in order to save our own skins, we are willing to do a deal with your slave masters. So he was not in favour of Deton. The fact that there were billions of people in, you know, like Red China and the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe who were, you know, living behind the Iron Curtain, living in communist countries. You know, I don't think he would have wanted a uh, detente with them. You know, I think that he, just as he did when he was president in the 1980s, I think that he would have pushed for America to win the Cold War, not just to keep it going, not just to, you know, have a balance of power. He wanted communism to end up collapsing. He wanted America to win the Cold War. And so in our own timeline, this ended up essentially happening uh, with the Soviet Union collapse and stuff. But I think that he would have upped the pressure. And I think that in this period here, rather than having detente, you would have had much tenser relationships between the United States and the Soviet Union. But just because Reagan was very harsh on his rhetoric didn't mean that he was, you know, in favour of war, didn't mean that he was, you know, completely unreasonable. So, for instance, in our own timeline, uh, like he signed the INF uh, Treaty, which basically uh, reduced the, uh, the capability of uh, intermediate uh, uh, nuclear missiles to be able to be launched between the powers. And, you know, in our own timeline also, there was the SALT Treaty of uh, 1972. And so I think that had he been president during this time, I think he probably still would have uh, assigned this because he was in favour of arms reduction. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't think it would have been unreasonable that he would have necessarily signed it and stuff. So that's something to kind of bear in mind that, yes, he his rhetoric was very harsh and a lot of people uh, painted him as being this kind of like warmongering, like kind of madman. But in reality, he also like was relatively reasonable and, you know, he, he did seek uh, peace with the Soviet Union. He just didn't believe that their system of, uh, of, of basically tyranny and slavery ought to continue. Then the big question is, would he have made peace with China in the same way that Richard Nixon did? So, you know, there's a famous thing where, you know, Nixon going to China and this ended up making communist China an American ally in the Cold War because, you know, you'd had the Sino-Soviet split. So within the communist world, uh, the Soviet Union and China were now vying for power. And so, you know, Richard Nixon exploited that by basically being like, OK, cool, we'll make peace with China. So, you know, would Reagan have necessarily done that? Mm, it's it's difficult because you know, it, like his rhetoric was so harsh that would he have been as nuanced as Nixon, uh, who's obviously a bit slippery and a bit unprincipled? Like, I don't know, like in a way, Richard Nixon, by having no real principles, it made it easier to kind of make that like transition. So I don't know, like, yeah, I think that's a, that's a big question that I can't really answer in this timeline. 
What I can tell you in this timeline is that you ought to like, comment, and subscribe. And also, most importantly, share with your friends, right? Actually, I've uh, brought in a special guest to uh, have this conversation, and that's Ronald Reagan. Well, hello there. You know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm Ronald Reagan, and while I died many, many years ago, I, uh, I've uh, come back just to let you know that you ought to uh, you know, like, comment, subscribe, and you know, share amongst your, some of your friends. You know, tell you the truth, I... Uh, I've got a little story. I've got all kinds of little stories like this, and uh, reminds me of a time when there was a fellow once, and uh, he was speaking to one of his friends, and he said, "Hey, there's uh, there's this channel called Skill and Key Productions, and I think you know it's really swell, and I think you ought to uh, subscribe to it, right? And, you know, uh, you know, watch a few of the videos, like all of them, comment on them, share amongst some of your other friends as well." And uh, well, this friend here said, "You know what? I'll subscribe when pigs fly." And you know, later that day, came on the news that a bunch of pigs and had uh, been sent up to space, you know, to you know go up uh, onto the moon. And so, you know, they end up flying. And this friend said, "Well, look, see, he said when pigs fly, pigs are flying now. So you're gonna subscribe." And this guy said, "I'll subscribe when the moon is made out of cheese." And well, you know. As it turned out, this uh, NASA trip where they went up into the, onto the moon, they, uh, well, they discovered when they were up there that it was made out of cheese and the, pig, and the pigs all started eating it. So at this point, the friend was saying, well, you said when pigs fly and you said when the moon made out of cheese, you know, you said you subscribed, so you, you, you know, so you subscribed yet? And his friend goes, over my dead body. And just then he was struck by a bolt of lightning and, you know, he died and, when this friend went to his funeral, he said, you know, he looked down in the coffin and said, well, you know, you said over your dead body and, well, seems you're pretty dead now, so you reckon you'll subscribe? And this guy said, when hell freezes over, that's when I'll subscribe. So anyway, he goes down, you know, to the other place and, you know, and uh, it was very hot there at first, but, you know, one fine morning, it all of a sudden got very chilly. You know, there was a, a blizzard that blew, that blew through and, uh, yeah, so, you know, lo and behold, you know, hell froze over. And at this point, a friend called down to him and said, Are you going to subscribe now? And he says, Well, you know what? I don't really have much choice. As it turns out, the only thing they got down here is the Kardashians, so I'll take my luck with uh, Skill and Key Productions. Thank you, Ronald, for that joke. Uh, I know you, you made that up a little bit earlier, uh, so well done. I'm proud of you for delivering it. Um, but yeah, anyway, like, comment, and subscribe, and uh, yeah, um, stay tuned for a lot more of our other videos as well. Uh, we're not finished quite with this video, so hang on a bit. There's a few more things to, to cover, but yeah, we'll get on to what the next video is going to be about uh, a little bit later on. So going back now to uh, Ronald Reagan, and uh, you know, famously when he was president, he pushed for something known as uh, Reaganomics, which was very similar to Thatcherism, which was basically you know uh, laissez-faire economics, yeah, like have deregulation, uh, tax cuts uh, for the rich and and for everyone else, etc. Basically shrinking the size of uh, of the central government down. Now this is something that he pushed through in the 1980s, but you know the 1980s was not the late 60s, yeah. So the late 60s people were still very much in favour of big government. In fact, even Richard Nixon once famously said, we're all Keynesian now. So, you know, so even, you know, both the Democrat Party and the Republican Party at this in this era were still very much in favour of big government, of price controls, of regulation, etc, etc. And so, not only would it have been difficult for him to have got this through uh, within the Republican Party, because obviously he had many liberal Republicans such as Nelson Rockefeller uh, and, you know, many other people as well, but on top of that, the Democratic Party was even further kind of to the left uh, than it was in, in the 1980s. So in 1968, as was the case in most years during this kind of era, yeah, you had Democrats controlling both the House and the Senate. But this is different from how it was in the 1980s. So in the 1980s, you know, the, the Democrat majority, you know, they allowed many of Reagan's uh, tax policies and other uh, deregulation to be put through. But with the Democratic Party of 1968, of allowed Reaganomics to basically come in place? Probably not. And so while he would have tried to roll back a lot of things in like the Great Society and stuff, you know, he would have been less successful than he was in our own time. Like, because what ended up happening in the 1970s through all the different like all shocks and, and everything and like all the kind of disruption, it broke apart this kind of like model of like Keynesianism and people 
kind of got fed up with it and basically wanted a change. And so that's how Ronald Reagan was able to win in 1980, but basically saying, like, we need to change the system that we currently have. But in 1968, the system was still kind of rolling on and it's still like doing relatively well. So people then wouldn't have necessarily wanted to change it as much. So while he would have, you know, reversed many of the uh, great society kind of bills and stuff, it still would have been very difficult for him to have wholesale like uprooted the entire welfare state in like the way that he kind of did in uh, 1980. So that's something to bear in mind. And also as well, you had the famous uh, Supreme Court case of Roe v. Wade uh, in 1973, and this uh, legalised abortion on demand uh, across all 50 states, regardless of uh, which states were in favour of it or not. And something to note is this, you know, in 1967, uh, California passed a law uh, which uh, legalised uh, abortion and Ronald Reagan, he was very much opposed to that. But at the end of the day, you know, even though he's a governor, at the end of the day, he still had to pay attention to what the uh, legislature wanted. And so he reluctantly had to sign it. And so I feel that much in the same way, uh, Roe v. Wade, you know, while he would have like really pushed against it and he would have probably tried to uh, elect um, a more conservative uh, justice to the Supreme Court as he did our own timeline, I don't think he would have been able to have like turned the tables on it. And so I think reluctantly, he would have also had to allow Roe v. Wade to take place. So that being said, yeah, like we've come to the end of this video, but as we say with all these alternative history uh, scenarios, the most likely thing to have happened was what actually ended up happening. Ronald Reagan in 1968 was not in a position and was not famous enough on a national level to become the president. You know, like being the governor of California is one thing, but to go from being an actor and then a few years later to being the president, yeah, people, it just, yeah, it just wouldn't have really happened realistically. But it is fun to theorise, yeah, so hopefully this video has kind of taught you a lot about the politics of that era and hopefully it's kind of given you a little bit of like food for thought in terms of like what would have happened if things gone a bit differently. So the next video is going to be on what if Bush overthrew Saddam. Now this is, you know, this is in the context of uh, the Gulf War in uh, 1991. So the coalition forces, uh, you know, they were able to basically wipe out the Iraqi army which had invaded Kuwait. And on a strategic level, there was no reason why they couldn't push all the way through to Baghdad. However, because of the international pressure at the time, and because George Bush Senior, uh, who was you know George Bush's like father and stuff, yeah, you know, the George Bush that we all know, yeah. So his father was the president at the time, and he didn't want to push forward. But because he wasn't overthrown in 1991, it meant that he stayed on until 2003, when George Bush's son ended up becoming the president and ended up doing the famous invasion of Iraq that we all know about. So. It basically, it basically envisioning what would have happened if like the Iraq war that we know of today would have happened basically 12 years earlier. So how would the 1990s have been different? How would America be different? And uh, yeah, so definitely stay tuned for that. And uh, as we said, you know, and as Ronald Reagan said, like, comment, subscribe, and share with people as well. You know, the sharing is like really important. Sharing is caring. So with that being said, have a great day and bye.